Are you saying phrases that demonstrate you have low emotional intelligence? Find out here today on Jimmy Rands. Click on that little box down there in the corner. It'll take you straight to IGTV for today's episode. JimmyRands.com is the website, and as always, you can engage live in the content. You gotta go follow me over on Instagram. I am at Livin Low Carb Man, L I V I N L O W C A R B M A N. Once you're there, engage live. We are going live Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time on the regular. So please be here, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Be there, be square, right here on Instagram. We also simulcast over here on my Facebook page. And I see Mike just uh, dropped in. And yes, I'm wearing Tony Romo's jersey. Thank you for noticing. Uh, and hey, Berkeley, thank you for being here today as well. We're also simulcasting over there on my YouTube stream. Thank you guys for joining us here today on Jimmy Rants. If you missed the live here on Instagram, be sure to pop on over to IGTV uh, is where you can watch it on replay. So that's where we house all the past episodes. Go check that out. Also, we throw them up over on YouTube. If you type in a keyword, Jimmy Rants, you'll find the show on YouTube. Uh, and then finally, uh, before we get to finally, we have a second to finally. Tuesday is what today is. And on Tuesdays on my show called The Living La Vida Low Carb Show, it's a podcast. Uh, the longest running health podcast on the internet. If you go wherever you listen to podcasts, go uh, to the Live and La Vida Low Carb Show today. We air the best of Jimmy Rants. And so you can hear some past episodes. Sometimes I'll do two or three episodes of Jimmy Rants if they're all kind of related and make them into one big audio show. You can listen to those on Tuesdays. Today is Tuesday, so go listen LLVLC.com. And now, finally, go to JimmyRants.com. It is the official website for this here show, uh, and you can watch all the past episodes there. Also, it gives you an opportunity to support me if you like what I do here. I don't have any sponsors on this show whatsoever. Click on the Patreon link, and any donation of any amount would be greatly appreciated. I picked up quite a few new Patreons last week, so thank you to everyone who is supporting my work. And I'm working on giving you some perks there. Once we build up a few more followers, I will start doing exclusive Jimmy Rants uh, episodes just for my Patreons uh, that will be bonus episodes, so one of your perks. Uh, I also am putting up early access to my podcast and the videos that I'm doing there. Uh, and I'm going to let you have some uh, input into the content of what comes on out here in the main show and I'm thinking about doing a giveaway soon. So get in on the action, jimmyrance.com, click on the Patreon link, and any donation would be greatly appreciated. Okay, you guys, I wanna talk about a topic here today because we often go through life and we use various phrases almost flippantly and, and not flippantly in a purposeful way of trying to hurt someone or in any way other than it's what's familiar to us. There's kind of this whole colloquialism, uh, like let's say somebody dies and the first thing you, you tell someone is, well, I'm sorry for your loss. Nothing wrong with that. Um, although there is something wrong with uh, someone dies and, well, if I can ever help you, just let me know. That one's kind of a popular one that really doesn't mean anything. But we say these things all the time, and we and, and they're well-meaning. This this is the problem when we say various phrases. I don't think anyone has ill intent um, about it. It's almost like when you lose weight, for example, people say, "Wow, you look so good." Well, that sounds like a good phrase until you think it through. And the connotation is, if someone looks good now because they've lost weight, did they look bad before? Like nobody ever thinks about those kind of ramifications of language. And, and we use these phrases all the time. I could do a whole Jimmy Rance probably just on all the phrases that we use commonly that you think are good and they're not as good as you think they are. And so my topic here today is about various phrases that we use um, that aren't necessarily the best. And according to this article I'm going to read from, uh, actually demonstrates that you have low emotional intelligence. And of course, people don't want to hear things like that because, oh, I, I had the best intentions and so therefore I should be credited with the intention. Okay, great. 
But if we're going to have communication with each other as human beings, the intention alone doesn't, doesn't just matter. Yes, the intention matters. If in your heart you didn't mean anything, ill will. That's one thing. But words mean things. The way you say things mean things. Uh, the tone by which you deliver those words means things. And so this was a really good article to maybe catch yourself or to catch it in other people that we have some common phrases that demonstrate kind of this low emotional intelligence. And it's, it's going to get into that here in this article. This is from Inc. Uh, magazine, by the way. People who use these three toxic phrases have very low emotional intelligence. Listen for these kinds of phrases and you'll understand people better than they probably understand themselves. Today I'm going to share with you a really neat trick that will improve your life. It worked for me anyway. It has to do with listening multidimensionally to what other people say and thus being tuned in to decipher what their motivation is. Frankly, you'll probably understand their motives better than they do most of the time. And it has to do with emotional intelligence. It's more like a double secret, jiu-jitsu version of emotional intelligence, both sharpening your perception in order to detect the level of another, of another person's emotional intelligence, and then use all of that to increase your own understanding. So, you guys ready for these toxic phrases? And if you just joined us, yes, we use common phrases in our life in the day-to-day. -day, and in our heads, they sound so good, right? And yet, are they really as effective as we think they are? So let's get into some of these. And don't feel bad. I've said all three of these at some point in my life, so I'm not saying this Jimmy Rance is a judgment if you've said anything. these things. Your host has said all three of these things at some point. But when you understand what their meaning is, it makes you take a little bit more caution. Toxic phrase number one. I know how you feel. Now, unless you're in the shoes of someone who has been through all the circumstances that led up to you saying that phrase, I know how you feel. Unless you have literally walked every little step of the way in your life that those people did in their life with all the circumstances, they're not parallel. And so when you tell people, I know how you feel, do you really? Now, maybe a better phrase instead of I know how you feel is, I can empathize with how you are feeling because my experience was, and then you describe your experience. But to say, I know how you feel, you immediately take the focus off of the person, you put it on yourself, and you almost make them feel invalidated with their story. Now again, none of us purposely set out to invalidate anyone when we say a phrase like, I know how you feel. But imagine a scenario, you're explaining a difficulty or a challenge that you're facing to a coworker. Perhaps you need him or her to offer up some advice to you. Perhaps you need them to uh, understand what you're saying. And maybe you just want to vent and have a listening ear. But having described the situation to someone you think is receptive, they will respond with, I know how you feel. Maybe they leave it right there and say nothing else. Or maybe they start to tell their own story. Have you ever done that? Has somebody told you something about their life and a struggle and they're trying to get some, some wise counsel and all of a sudden you say, I know how you feel. What is that person supposed to, to think at that point? Oh, 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 okay, thank you for telling me you know how I feel. You don't. Uh, but tell me more, but then they start telling their own story, something that might or might not really have any relevance to the situation at hand. Like we've all done that. And I think it's, it's human nature to want to provide comfort for another human being when they're going through a difficult process. And so people will try to relate to it, even if they have no experience on it. And I'll tell you one thing I have struggled with is I'm a fixer. That's just in my nature. I like to be a fixer. Somebody comes to me with a problem. Okay, bada bing, bada boom, here's how you fix it. That's just the way my brain works. And so if I offer up advice, it's not with the intention of harming that person, but to actually help them. And what I've found is it's better to listen 
and absorb and relate to that person. If you say, I know how you feel and you just leave it there, that doesn't really help the person. If you say, I know how you feel, now tell me more. How can I help you? How can I better help you understand the situation maybe that you're not seeing because you're going through it? Um, you start to ask yourself, was I boring him or her? Was I going on for too long? Are we talking about you now? So the narcissism does tend to come in a little bit where we get a little bit self-absorbed and self-interested when someone tells us their issues and then you say, I know how you feel. So if you are one of those people that when you're talking to someone, you often tell them, you know, I know how you feel. Now, the only thing we can say I know how you feel about this year is, man, lockdown was really bad. I was going crazy and da da da. I know how you feel. You know everybody in the world knows how you feel. Now, maybe not to the same extent, but we all know what COVID-19 lockdown did for us. But you can't say to someone who lost a child, I know how you feel, unless you've lost a child. And even then, the circumstances were different. We always like to relate to other humans with our own human experiences. And that's the way we relate. But I wonder sometimes saying nothing is better than saying something like, I know how you feel. Are you getting me here? That was a really big one there. Toxic phrase number two. See if you've said this one. Can't you just, and then fill in the blank, okay? This is one of my favorite ones to highlight. Imagine once again, you're describing a situation or you're telling a story. Like all good stories, there's going to be conflict in there. There's something that the protagonist has to overcome, whether the protagonist is you, sharing a challenge you're facing, or another person. I'm so exhausted at night coming home, making dinner for my kids, and getting the baby to bed. Can't you just get your husband to make dinner instead? There's the can't you just, okay? Or how about this one? My employees are upset because nobody wants to work on the weekend, or right now during COVID, nobody wants to work from home. They wanna get out of the house. Can't you just tell them this is the deal and if they don't like it, go find another job? Or here's another example. I've tried so hard for so long to lose 10 pounds, but nothing works. <laughs> this person that wrote this must be a low carber. Can't you just cut out your carbs more during the day and just stop eating after sundown? You say to yourself, if I could just do it, I probably would, don't you think? So the can't you just. It's kind of a nauseating phrase because it almost throws an onus of pointing fingers back on the person. And of course, someone who's going through a situation where they're simply just trying to vent, trying to get a message out there, trying to get a little bit of empathy, then they get this can't you just response and it just, it turns into this really ugliness if you think about it because immediately their feelings and their thoughts are invalidated as if, okay, I haven't, thought to think of these other alternatives that you're, can't you just point it out? Of course you have, but that's not the point. You're dealing with the situation. Now, I wonder if you could rephrase the can't you just to say the same thing, but say it in a nicer way. So I'm uh, so exhausted at night coming home, making dinner for my kids, getting the baby to bed. So then instead of can't you just get your husband to make dinner instead, you, you could say, well, have you been able to work out that maybe someone else could possibly make the dinner and take care of those things for you? Have you expressed that to say your husband, for example? You see how it doesn't point fingers, it's more having a conversation. Then that person may say, well, you know, I, I, I didn't wanna burden him and never, and then that's where the conversation can take place. Rather than can't you just in pointing fingers, it says, oh, I didn't even think to ask my husband to see if they could help. I just assumed I needed to take all that on myself. Or my employees are upset because nobody wants to work on the weekend. Rather than can't you just tell them this is the deal and they don't like it, find another job. 
you could say, you know what, we're all struggling uh, right now and trying to have a job and, and we're all going to meet challenges here. And I'll tell you what, uh, employees, if this is difficult, I understand. How about we do a rotation shift where I as the manager will come in and I will work on the weekends uh, every other weekend and then we'll shift you guys out and, and rotate you. What do you think about that? And so then that becomes the conversation. You see what I'm talking about? You take away the pointing of the fingers and you make it more interactive. I tried so hard for so long to lose those last 10 pounds, nothing works. Uh, the can't you just cut out more carbs and stop eating after sundown is not helpful. So then what about, uh, and of course this is in my area, talking about weight loss and health and nutrition. I'd say, well, if you're trying so hard to lose those last 10 pounds, perhaps it's because you're worrying about it. And so why don't we go take a yoga class together and in that class you'll learn how to meditate and breathe and relax and have strategies that before long will lead to weight loss to lose that last 10 pounds. So you see how you can reframe it and get rid of these toxic phrases? And if you joined us late, yes, we are talking about some toxic phrases that we all use in our lives. The first one, I know how you feel. No, you don't always know how people feel. And and it's it's a tough one when you say that. The second one is, can't you just blank? No, no, I can't just blank. Thank you for playing. Let's get to the third one. How are you doing, good? Now you might be asking, how can someone asking someone else how they're doing be toxic? But listen carefully to the language. How you doing, good? And what can it tell us about our emotional intelligence when you hear that phrase I just said? The first four words of this five word question are not that bad. If you just said, how are you doing? And you stop there, that would be a great question. But when you say, how are you doing? Good? It's the good to be look uh, on the lookout for. It seems like you're being empathetic right up until the person asking you the question provides the acceptable answer. So inherent in, how are you doing, good? The assumption is, well, you have to be good because if you're not good, I don't wanna hear it because that's what you're telling people. How are you doing, good? If you go, oh no, I'm really bad, I'm having a tough day, no, oh my God, oh, I didn't mean to do oh, oh. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like, don't ask people how they're doing because they might tell you. Um, you know people like that in your life. How are you doing? Oh man, my dog peed on my pants today and I had to go wash them. And then when I was washing them, I stubbed my toe in the cat box and then the cat jumped a mile and scratched my leg. And they go on and on and on. You don't want to know how some people are doing. You, you know certain people you don't ask that question to. But if you say, how are you doing? Good. You're almost putting them in a box that they have to say, uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. Uh, I'm not really, but I'm going to tell you that. It's about what they want to hear, not the truth. Objection, you could call out if your lawyer uh, was in a courtroom. You're leading the witness. So yes, in a court of law, how are you doing? Good? The lawyer could say, well, wait a minute. You're leading, you're leading the witness. Only you're not, so you can't. So instead of that, here's what you can do instead. It's not me, it's you. I must admit I've been fascinated by these questions of emotional intelligence. Uh, I've written about them before, largely, largely from the point of view of suggesting verbal pitfalls to avoid so you can develop and exhibit greater emotional intelligence. But a few weeks ago, I read an article about how to give good advice. I realized that it offers insights into how to judge the advice other people give you. Do you have people in your life that you go to for advice? Like if you don't have close friends in your life that whenever things are challenging for you and you need someone you trust, uh, you need to get some people like that. I can count on one hand the number of people that I could call uh, or text and ask for advice. And, and I'm very grateful for those people. Those people offer really uh, incredible advice for me. 
I've been going through some stuff in 2020 beyond COVID and everything that I, if I didn't have these people in my life, I would be going a little bit batty right now because I know they're going to tell me honestly what's going on. They're not going to be judgmental towards me. They're going to love me all the way through it. Um, but at the same time, they're not going to pull any of these toxic phrases on me. They know I would slap them upside the head if they did. Um, and vice versa. I'm there for them when they're going through their stuff. And so the short version is simply to keep track of how many questions people ask you during the course of a conversation. If they spend much of the time probing you, pushing you, asking lots of questions, clearly trying to understand your situation, that's your sign you've got a good friend, someone who's actually listening. Because if someone is not asking you questions, if they're not pushing you to provide answers when you're kind of hemming and hawing, um, if they're not trying to clearly understand what's happening in your situation, then you know they're not engaged in you and they're kind of going through the motions. And it's almost that yeah, yeah, yeah response of you present a situation, yeah, 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 okay, and now let's move on, as if what you said was invalidated. Let go of those people in your life, by the way, because they're not serving you well. You don't need a yeah, 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 friend. You need a how can I help you, friend. And that's the kind of friendships you should have. If they quickly indicate either explicitly or implicitly, I've heard enough. Here's what you need to do. That there is a bad sign. And this is a part of my kind of personality type of wanting to be a fixer. Uh rather than getting the full picture, sometimes I do jump to what I think could be a solution sooner than I should. Now, it doesn't mean offering solutions is a, a inherently bad thing, but until you hear the full context of everything that's being said, you really can't offer anything until you get that full context. And so if someone quickly tries to get to the, here's how you fix that problem I've heard 30 seconds of, then you know that's a bad sign. But we're always looking for advice. Sometimes we're looking for more than just advice. Sometimes just a listening ear. Not everybody wants to give that though. All right, so when you start looking at the world through the prism uh, like this of, of looking for emotional intelligence, insights come fast and furious. There are two ways people can respond to others in a conversation. You can either support the other person by keeping the focus of the conversation solely on them. Can I tell you that is incredibly hard because when you're talking to people, when people tell you a story, what's going on in your head? All these stories of you relating to that story they're telling you in your own life. And when you have relatability, that's what makes your that's what makes people connect is you have relatability about shared life experiences. Some of my best friends in the world today went through childhood trauma, physical, emotional abuse, just like me. And so I'm able to relate to them because I know we have a commonality. A lot of you guys relate to me personally uh, through Jimmy Rance and other work because of our shared interest in nutrition and ketogenic diets and eating, uh, eating bacon, for example. And so you have that connectability with people um, and, and it's through that connection uh, that you bond. And so when you support the other person, you keep the focus of conversation just on them. Or you might be someone who shifts the conversation, which then puts the focus on themselves. Okay? By and large, people exhibiting high emotional intelligence will often only be in the support response. So if someone is emotionally aware that when someone is sharing a distressing story that's happening in their life, they're emotionally aware enough to know this ain't about me. This is about them and, and I need to show support for them. Don't infuse my own story. Now some people get weird about that. Well, tell me how your day's going. And so you're the one with the issue but then you feel guilty because they're only focusing on you. I had a conversation just yesterday uh, about this where I had an issue and a friend wanted to listen to my issue. And I felt that propensity to want to ask how they were doing. 
Um, now, once we kind of worked through some of the issue on of my issue, then they shared what was going on with them, and I was completely fine at that point. But I got the support that I needed, and, and uh, this person did not try to shift the conversation to themselves early. Uh, people who exhibit low emotional intelligence use the shift pretty quick. So, think back to all those examples that I just shared earlier. None of us is perfect. None of us exhibits a high emotional intelligence all the time. So give yourself some grace. If this is kind of hard to hear, don't worry about it. Most of us are, are challenged by this. Um, any more than any of us flawlessly exhibit high cognitive intelligence or perfect memory all the time. This goes both ways, weighing and considering your own imperfections as many of us do, but also just considering whether the other people you're talking to uh, don't have the self-awareness or level of emotional intelligence to be able to understand. So you're gonna notice this now. Now that I've put this out here on Jimmy Rants, you're gonna be in conversations and you might catch yourself before you go into one of these rabbit holes. And I'm gonna guarantee you right now, there are people in your life who have extremely low emotional intelligence, and you're gonna see it very vividly now. If you haven't noticed before now, you're about to notice it more than ever before. I can't imagine that I'd ask my preschool age daughter to help me think through a legal argument. She, uh, it's a lawyer writing this. She's very smart and I love her, and I'm sure someday when she's grown up, she could debate me under the table, but right now, she's just not equipped. It would be a moral or wouldn't be a moral judgment. It would just be silly for me to try that. So the same thing applies when you're on the lookout for other people's emotional intelligence and simply tracking whether their interactions indicate shift or support. And that's why it can be so liberating to realize by looking out for these conversational clues that it's not that you were being boring necessarily or missing an answer that other person thinks would be just so easy. Instead, the other person might simply not be emotionally intelligent enough to recognize this difference between the shifting and the supporting. And because you, now you're paying attention to your language and apply this simple observational trick, you understand completely. So I love this article, Inc. Magazine, people who use these three toxic phrases have very low emotional intelligence. Have any of you ever used this? I know how you feel. Can't you just blank? How you doing, good? Like we, we use these things almost as throwaway lines. There's so much of our language that we use in the day to day that I think we use it just because it's familiar. We never really examined it. Maybe I need to do a Jimmy Rants on all these familiar phrases and things that we say that at the end of the day, they don't really serve a good purpose. We just say them because they're socially acceptable to say. And your language matters. And how you interact with other people matters. And, and the way you say things. So do you have a low emotional intelligence? Do you have a high? Are you kind of somewhere in the middle? Let's talk about it here today on Jimmy Rance. Let's see what you guys have to say. I'm gonna come over here first to my Instagram page then over to my Facebook page, finally to YouTube. Thank you all for being here today on Jimmy Ranch. JimmyRance.com is the website. Dr. Sandy B, I see such a gap in the keto community that so many don't approach these important psychological components to mental health and op optimal function. Thank you for your leadership. Well, thank you, uh, Sandy. I try to remind people that the totality of your health is not just about the food you put in your mouth. Yes, the food matters, obviously. I've been the low carb keto guy for many, many years. But if you don't talk about the manifestation of what that food does in your body and how it manifests in action, in, in the way your brain operates and, and some of these other uh, things, then you're missing the totality of health. So. Thank you for acknowledging that I do try to put the uh, importance of these kinds of things on the radar uh, because they are of paramount importance uh, and I'll keep sharing about those here on Jimmy Rants. Thank you, Instagram. Let's pop over here now to my Facebook page. What's up, Facebook? Thanks for being here today. See what you have to say about this one. Um, 
Tracy says, uh, because of you coming out about your childhood trauma, it helped me deal with mine. I was molested for many years as a child. I now have joined a group of survivors of childhood sex abuse. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the day I get to meet you in person. Well, Tracy, same. I would love uh, to meet you someday uh, when we're not all scared of the corona. But yeah, I did not hesitate to share about the childhood trauma stuff. And I know some people were telling me, some of my uh, not so friends huh, were telling me, well, you need to stick to keto and that's just off the beaten path a little bit too much. I'm like, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm gonna stay true to me. Like I get complaints sometimes because on Jimmy Rants, I don't stick to keto per se. I'm like, it's not called keto rants, it's called Jimmy Rants. And there's more to my life than just ketogenic diets. I think they're wonderful. But at the end of the day, what's important to me, I'm gonna talk about. And so uh, I'm glad to hear, by the way, Tracy, that my sharing about childhood trauma normalized it for you enough that you are now dealing with it. So that makes me feel good that, that I was able to help you. Nancy says, I truly believe active listening is becoming a lost art, along with the ability to listen to what a person is not saying. Ooh, that's so important. Many times hearing what someone isn't saying will allow you to see their problem and pain and be able to gently shift the conversation towards that and always be aware of when someone isn't ready to talk about a problem at the moment. You can revisit it, revisit it later if appropriate. I have one friend that when they're going through something tough, they, they tend to go in a shell. And then you ask them, you wanna talk about it? No. Well, can we talk about it later? Maybe. And then we never talk about it. So sometimes the maybe never comes to fruition. I suppose that's their right at that point, but you're right, active listening, lost art, uh, people wanna hear themselves. And I guess that's a product of social media. Everybody thinks because they have a social media page that they have a voice and that everybody deserves to have their voice heard. Um, newsflash, Snowflake, you do not deserve to have your voice heard always. You just don't. Um, but you can express it and I can ignore, just like a lot of people. Berkeley says, yes, we need to take custody of our words, learning I don't always have to be right, don't have to fix, just love people where they are. Yes, we're all in different places. Even if we have experienced something, we don't know how they feel exactly. Exactly, Berkeley, that's the thing. You could go through a specific circumstance uh, in your view of how you went through it, but that does not translate to because you went through uh, that circumstance that you totally understand that person's uh, specific circumstance. So thank you for that reminder and thank you guys over on Facebook. Now let's pop over here to my YouTube channel, see what they have to say. Um, listening to someone is more powerful than people realize. I'm not great with words, which has taught me to just sit and listen. In return, it helps me grasp what the whole situation may be. Surely that is a great skill. You're probably a highly sought after friend because of that. Darlene says, I'm in between. I tend to want to be a helper. Also, I do have to think prior to speaking. Lest I sound too empathetic, I must learn to consider the person that I'm speaking with. Yes. Darlene also says, yes, it's a product of social media, tending to believe yours is the only solution. Oh man. That can preach, and, and, and it's not just a certain generation. Like I know we talked about millennials, and now Gen Z is coming up, um, versus like baby boomers and Gen X is my generation. It hits every generation. This is not a specific to young people, specific to older people thing. It's everybody. And, it's, and you have to be recognizing when someone is demonstrating this low emotional intelligence, um, and even in yourself, you just have to recognize it for it to be totally understood. Bonnie says, great points, thank you. Agree uh, more to life than just keto. Oh, there's a lot more life than keto. Um, I love keto, but and I've written a many a book on it, and I've done many a podcast on it, and can I tell you, I'm ready to talk about a whole lot more things, which was one of the reasons I created Jimmy Rance was I needed an outlet to talk about other things. Now I still talk about it and bring in the relevant concept and it also applies uh, in a many of the things that I do, but I'm not gonna just 
tie myself down to talking about low carb and keto solely for the rest of my life. Like if you guys aren't interested in a topic, then you just won't listen or watch that particular thing. It's no big deal. It doesn't mean you're going to tune me out though, because when I do say something you're interested in, you want to listen. Um, and I, that will always be true. Rachel says, I've been a bartender for over a decade. Drunk people are the worst with this. Oh boy. They don't listen at all. Can can they listen, Rachel, when they're listening to me? I have a story to tell you. It's the best story ever. What was I saying? Uh, and so you're going to have those people. They just think of what they will say next. <laughs> it makes sense that alcohol would lower your emotional intelligence uh, and your and your total intelligence. <laughs> I'm not one of those people who gets inebriated. So uh, uh, one time uh, on an event, I had a guy that's been a longtime friend of mine. He said, I want to see Jimmy Moore drunk. And I'm like, good luck with that because I don't drink enough to get drunk. And he said, I want to see it. I'll buy all the drinks till I see you plastered. So he bought me a bunch of mojitos and I got pretty plastered, but it took about 10 to 12 before I got drunk. Now, having never been drunk before, I thought it would happen sooner than that. They must have been weak mojitos, but anyway, Rachel, I'm gonna have you make me a mojito someday so uh, you can show me what one that is strong is supposed to taste like, but yes, this uh, topic here today, guys, I hope this was helpful. Maybe you'll recognize this in yourself. Maybe you'll recognize it in other people. But the key is find that support part of trying to be with people and interact with people rather than uh, sticking to your own narrative and shifting the attention to yourself, um, which is something we're all a little bit narcissistic in that way. Well, oh, it sucks you went through that. Well, let me tell you about the time I... Uh, and, and I had a recent podcast guest on, uh, Daryl Edwards. He lost his sister to cancer, um, about five years ago. And he had people, no lie, you guys, he had people that he told that to, and they're like, oh yeah, I can certainly relate. I lost my dog. And Daryl was just like, like, do people really hear themselves when they say that losing a dog is the same as losing your sister to cancer? And so I think sometimes we are so desperate to want to interact with people that we don't think how is what I'm saying going to help or hurt the situation. And obviously in that situation, it, it was not helpful at all. Um, it was pretty heartless, actually. So be aware, you guys. Improve your emotional intelligence. Um, and you do that through supporting other people. That's it for this episode of Jimmy Ranch. JimmyRance.com is the website. And as always, you can engage live in the content. You got to go follow me right here. Instagram, I'm at Living Low Carb Man, L-I-V-I-N-L-O-W-C-A-R-B-M-A-N. Once you're there, engage live Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern time right here on Instagram Live. We also simulcast over here on my Facebook page. So thank you guys for being here, as well as on my YouTube channel. Thank you all for being here today on Jimmy Rants. Jenny says, I'm all about learning uh, what is closing communication doors and avoiding that. Recently learned how my basic thought process, which happens out loud because I'm extroverted, tends to make folks feel like I'm second guessing them when I'm not. Ooh. That's interesting, Jenny. So, and it's good you've become self-aware of that as well. So that's really, really awesome. Um, if you missed the live, please watch it on replay on IGTV. We put it up right after the show is over. We also throw them up over on YouTube. Type in the keyword Jimmy Ranch. You will find the show. Today is uh, Living La Vida Low Carb Show, Jimmy Ranch Day. So on Tuesdays, we air a best of, and it's the audio version of uh, recent Jimmy Ranch episodes. So go to llvlc.com to listen to that show. Finally, go to jimmyrance.com, the official website for this show. Click on the Patreon link after you watch a few videos. If you like what I do here, throw me a few pennies, and any amount uh, that you can give would be greatly appreciated. All right, guys, that's it for now. We'll be back again real soon with more Jimmy Rants, and we'll see you then.